and welcome to this edition of Talk About Cars. During this segment, we're going to talk a little bit about brakes. No matter what kind of a car it is, it's got to have brakes. And if it doesn't have brakes, ay yeah, yeah, you're going to be in big trouble. Whether it's disc brakes like this car has front and rear, or disc and drum, or remember the old just drum brakes? Back in the 50s and 60s, that's what we had. How long can they last? How long do they last? 25,000 miles, 15,000 miles. People that run from, let's say, Lakeville, Middleborough to Boston on the highway, they can go 100 plus thousand miles without ever replacing the brakes. Tires, yeah, but brakes usually will last on the highway quite a bit. Also, a Subaru. I remember when the Subarus were rattly, they were vibrating, they sounded like cement mixes, Ugh, they oil leaks, they had head gasket problems, not to mention catalytic converters. But for 2015, the new Outback is a car that I could definitely recommend. We'll talk about that the brakes, and junk in the trunk. Stay tuned for that when we come back. Here we have a 2009 Corolla that has about 84,000 miles on it. And I drove the car last week and found the brake pedal wasn't where it needs to be. It's down probably about halfway. I asked the young girl that drives it, and she said, seems fine to me. So then I thought about it. Does it? In you know, the lower brake pedal and the way the car rides, even the seat composition, the way this, you fit into the seat, is very similar to the bed you have at home and the couch. We kind of get used to the sagginess of the couch and the bed, and we get used to the lower brake pedal. If I didn't mention it, this gal would not have probably even realized it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put it up in the air, we're gonna pull the wheels, inspect the brakes. And by the way, this car has the disc brakes in the front, and you got it, the drum brakes in the rear. In a perfect world, an electric impact such as this one should take the lugs off. If not, then we'd have to resort to using the air. It's a good time to take a look at all the suspension components when you pull the wheels, because you can actually look inside at the struts and all of the links and bushings and things of that nature. Plus, you can get a really good look at the tire to see how it's wearing. A lot of today's cars, people say, oh, I have to get it lined up in the spring and the fall. Not like in the old days. A lot of times with today's vehicles, alignments can last two, three, four years. As long as the tire itself is looking and wearing evenly, you're all set. If you find that the tire has scalloping marks in it and it's not smooth, that usually is an out of balance situation or there's a problem with something in the suspension. Remember, an alignment will cause the car's tire to wear either side in the middle or something in that nature. But if you have a tire that's out of balance or there's a problem with the front end, you'll see what they call scalloping or bumping in the tires. Now we're going to grab a light and we're going to actually take a good close look at these front brakes and uh, we'll see what's going on with them. I did ask the person that drives this car if there was any shaking, which would be what we call pulsating at 50, 60 miles an hour on the highway, and they said no, and they said they never even noticed that the brake pedal was low. So I'm going to go get a light and then we're going to take a look at the inside of these brake pads and see what they look like. Okay, I'm looking inside at the brake caliper and there's actually a, a vented area where my finger is right here and we can actually see that the brake pads are in really good condition and the brake rotors are in good condition as well. Even though there's, they're not shiny and clean like this car here, these have been on here for it looks like six months to a year. Even brand new brake rotors will show signs of rust within about 90 days, which is three months uh, with the New England weather conditions that we have. Even in Florida, where you never see any snow or salt in the roads, 
a lot of times this metal will bring up a little bit of surface rusting. But everything looks really, really good on this car. Now we'll take a look at the rear brakes. Do you remember I told you about the drum brakes? Well, Toyota and other manufacturers have stayed with the drum brakes on a lot of their vehicles. Even Generous Motors, I call it Generous Motors, it's actually General Motors, on some of their trucks where people were complaining about the brakes, they went back to putting on rear drum style brakes. There are no adjustments in a disc brake system at all. The Rear drum brakes, yes, they have adjustments on them. It's called a star wheel, and a lot of times people never even think about adjusting them. This is the drum brake system. This is actually a brake drum. The brake shoes are here and here inside. I can't release the rust and break the seal that normally happens on a vehicle like this. So I've got a space age tool called a hammer, and hopefully we'll be able to adjust the brakes if they need it with the pliers. So what we're going to do is just take lightly and hit the drum and that's enough to break the bond and the seal and as you can see now it popped off about an eighth of an inch now I should be able to in a perfect world pull it off. There are little holes here that you can put bolts in to try to force it out. We use that for a last resort because when you do that, it can sometimes actually bend the plate here of the drum area and then you have a drum that's warped and it's no good. So here we have a drum brake system on this Toyota, which is a 2009. And for like 2011 and years on New Year's and some of the other models, like this other Toyota that we showed you when we opened the program up, we do have what they call disc brakes front and rear. But this is a drum brake system and this is the actual brake shoe material and it's in excellent condition. These have been replaced and that's probably, these probably have, by looking at them, maybe about, oh, I'd say six or 8,000 miles on them. And the star wheel adjuster, which we're going to get a close-up for you, is right here. And what we're going to do is we're going to adjust it up a little bit to bring the brake pedal up a little bit. As long as our wheel is good on the other side and the brakes check out fine, this car is just probably going to need an adjustment. And when the owner gets in the car, she's going to say, oh my goodness, the brake pedal is up much higher. The brake pedal can actually come up anywhere between 3 eighths and a half an inch with a simple adjustment of the rear brake shoes. Sometimes you need to bleed the system out if the system has been open, the hydraulic fluid. And that will make a big difference. Now, what happens if you were to over tighten the brake shoe? Great question. What would happen is as you go on the highway, the friction would start to heat everything up. And what would happen is the brake shoes would actually get tighter and tighter in contact with the brake drum and it could cause a vibration and it would cause actually a lack of braking on the highway until the brake shoes wore down. So you want to make sure you don't over adjust the brakes. Another idea or another tip, when it comes to these brake drums here, what I usually do is I'll put it back on the car backwards like this. That way there I can make sure that there's no rust build up here around the centering hub and the actual brake drum. Then I'll take a light and I'll look inside to see what the brake drum actually looks like to make sure there's no pitting, there's no scoring, no cracking, and there's no heavy lines or rust. And you can do that very easily by just spinning it around and taking a look. This is an absolutely fabulous condition and on the outer area here, the lip, where there's actually no brake shoe contact, sometimes you have a problem with that. It builds up a lot of rust. This car is an, this brake drum on this car is in absolutely fabulous condition. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this off and I'm going to adjust the star wheel to put just a little bit of a drag, a very slight drag on the brake drum itself. And that way there, when we go to stop, this car will actually stop a lot better. And remember that emergency brake that you never use, kind of like the glove compartment? Little in the glove box, you have that little thing called an owner's manual. Yeah, the Bible they call it. When's the last time you looked at that or used your parking brake? When we adjust the, these rear brake shoes, it will actually also adjust the parking brake. So the parking brake will actually feel stiffer, a little harder, and will not go down as far. Well, I was going to use a pair of pliers to actually adjust up the star wheel, but my trusty little screwdriver is going to be 
a lot more user friendly. And yeah, your hands do get dirty, your clothes do get dirty, but it certainly is a well worthwhile investment. So what we're going to do is we're going to look, there's a little star wheel adjuster in there, so we will know which way we have to adjust the, uh, the star wheel. We're going to go a few clicks, and you can hear that. That's about four or five clicks. That's going to be our starting point. And well, what happens if you went too far? I will not be able to put the brake drum back on because the brake shoes now are actually pushed out a little bit and that will cause a problem or interference with the brake drum going back on. So we took it up I think four or five, six clicks and that's a good starting point. I've seen some vehicles that you can go eight or ten clicks and that's what that's doing. That's bringing the brake shoe out closer to the brake drum. What happens if you can't adjust the style wheel adjuster? You have to take the brakes apart put them on the bench and actually clean and lubricate everything and we've done that on a lot more than one occasion especially here with the New England weather so I'm going to grab my brake drum now and see if it will go back on well we've taken up about four or five clicks on the brake drum on the star wheel and the brake drum actually slides on very very nicely okay and it still turns very very easily okay so what we're going to do is go a few more clicks and um, see if it can uh, tighten up just a little bit more. Okay, now we'll see if this drum fits back on there. It fits back on, and really there still, still is no drag at all on these brakes. So what we're going to do is we're going to take them up a couple of more clicks, and is there an easy way to do this? No, it's called trial and error. And if I did go too many clicks, what I would do is just pull the brake drum back off, and what I would have to do is just back off the adjustment a little bit. Okay, that's as far as we're going to go with this. We have a nice little bit of drag on it. Now I'm going to go pull the other side off and take a look at it. So the brakes are all done, good shape. We can now, we're going to take a look at the brake metal lines and the rubber flex hoses. Remember, we live in New England and vehicles are always subject to, you got it, rust and corrosion. So as we look underneath here, we'll start with the left front wheel. We look at the brake rubber flex hose. There was no cracks in that. And again, that is the brake caliper from the inside looking at it. And the brake lines and gas lines are all pretty much run together down the vehicle. Years ago, Toyota used to have on these vehicles a black plastic mesh to hold these in place so with the tightening of the belt in the economy they put some just plastic clips these lines are in excellent condition and here's a secret they're coated so they'll probably outlast the car we look all the way down to it as well and you know as you look down all the gas and brake lines look really good and you see rust build up here around the frame of the vehicle well that's normal because of the metal and the iron that's not coated from the factory and this is what they call the rear cross member that's rusty and that's going to be normal in the old days we had gas tanks that leaked you ever have an old car that the gas tank started leaking in hello we're plastic so we're not going to have any problems there so looking at all the brake lines everything looks real good on this vehicle and we can advise a customer that there are no leaks on this car either which is a good point to take up on any car when you put a car up in the air always take a look underneath it see if there's anything leaking see if there's the exhaust is tight everything looks real good on this 2009 209 toyota corolla Well, we told you about looking for the uh, spare tire. Well, unless you have a minivan, the majority of spare tires, if your car still has a spare tire, is in the trunk. So we're going to open up the trunk, and we're going to see just how much junk is in the trunk. <laughs> okay, water bottles. Well, that might be good in the summertime, but what happens in the middle of the winter when they, they freeze up and they pop, and the owner of the car doesn't go back into the trunk, and uh, retrieve the bottles. In the springtime, what are we gonna have? A mess. All right, well, this looks like some kind of a, a seat. Maybe she goes to a lot of the, uh, the ball games or soccer mom games or whatever. And we're prepared for a rainstorm? I don't know what that is. Oh, heat and glow. We got all kinds of personal stuff. This is all to get to the trunk. 
Well, we know one thing. This person has children, which is a good thing. All right, and I think she believes in going to Hawaii. All right, as we continue, we look and we look. We're getting close. We're getting close. Hey, there it is. We have struck gold. We have a spare tire. We're going to take a look and see what we have for air in the spare. This is one of those mini spare or temporary spare tires that should have on average right around 50 pounds of air in it. And remember, a tire will lose on average anywhere from a half to two pounds of air a month. Let's take a look and see what we got for air pressure. Well, we've got actually about 20 pounds of air in this tire. Is that going to make it if we have to put it on the car? No. These are so small and tiny that they do require the same amount of air as it says on the side, which is around 50 pounds of air. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put some air in the tire, and that will at least give us the stability in case she ever does get a spare tire. And who knows, maybe she has that uh, AAA card or maybe some other form of uh, roadside insurance or roadside programs. But I'm going to get some air in the tire, and then we'll try to reorganize the junk in the trunk and do you think we should put the water bottles back in? I think we'll put them right in it as last. That will be right there for her to take out when she goes home tonight. And we'll have to leave a little note for the young girl that drives this car to make sure that she removes a lot of the junk from the trunk. I still don't know why. She, maybe she has, maybe she's into boating or yachting. Who knows? Tied a nice knot anyway. Okay, so now we get ready to put all our stuff back in. In our next segment, we're going to talk about jump-starting a car. It, should you do it? Wow. Sometimes when you jump-start a car, if you don't do it correctly, you can smoke the car computer, which, by the way, on a Toyota like this is about 900 buckos. There are much easier and safer ways than using the old... Uh, battery jumper cables these days and no we're not talking about the stuff you saw on TV that you can plug into the cigarette lighter those things don't work at all all right so we've organized the stuff in the trunk okay the water bottles are going to be the first to come out because with the temperature you know heading down below freezing we certainly don't need to have frozen water bottles that are going to pop out and destroy the trunk with all the junk and all the water we don't need that how about some windshield washer fluid? Hmm, maybe some de-icer? Yeah, that works pretty well. Uh, maybe a little bit of sand? Yeah, kitty litter, whatever, that always works. But what you don't want to do is put a lot of weight in the trunk on a front-wheel drive car because what that does, that'll lift up the uh, front of the car and the wheels will lose traction much more easily. If it's a rear drive car, you know what? Throw whatever junk you want in the trunk. But on a front wheel drive car, you want to kind of limit it because remember, your front wheels do the pulling, your front wheels do the turning, your front wheels do the majority of the stopping because all the weight is up front. And that's where you get your traction from the wheel spinning and turning. So you want to keep the trunk to a, a minimum, but again, a few essential items, maybe like a blanket, cell phone, battery or something, whatever, stuff like that that doesn't weigh a whole lot. Well, as I promised, we're going to take a quick look to find the cabin filter, even if this car has a cabin filter. 09 Corollas, Camrys, and just about any car from about 2006 on up. Even some of the 2002 models have cabin filters. We've changed many of these. So on these Toyotas, what you need to do is you just need to open a glove compartment like so. Ah, very, very little stuff in the glove box, which is good. And you open the glove box up, you take a couple of fingers, and you push the inner side of the uh, outer side of the glove box panel in and that will allow you to let it flop down and you look inside with a light of course and you find that there is uh, a little uh, button you push the button and you pull off the little cover that goes right up there space age material and the cabin filter is located right in here very very simple and again, these cabin filters are very, very good. And once a year, twice, once every two years is a good idea. Uh, this cabin filter has got a lot of, I say, junk in it. And whoever put it in didn't do it correctly. So the stuff that normally would be, as you can see, that's all junk in there, normally would come out when they put the cabin filter in, they kind of crushed it 
and there you go. You can see all the white that was never working because whoever put it in actually didn't do it right. They forced it in and they didn't take their time with it. So this car does need a cabinet filter, which we'll get a new one uh, from the parts store or the dealership and we'll put it in. But for right now, we're just going to empty it out, then we'll wipe the floor up and we'll put it back in and we're going to have to see about getting a new filter for it. But again, you can see that the person that put this in didn't take their time, unfortunately, and it was forced in. So I'm going to put this back in because we do not have a new one here to put in right now. But again, it's pretty simple to do. And what it is, you can actually sometimes see daylight through it. You can see inside of it. And you can see how white the light is where it never was working at all because it was crushed. Then we go back down to here and we go, you can actually see some dirt in there. And what that's doing, it's not going to clean the smell out of the air, but it, was, it is going to do is take all the pollutants and it's going to take a lot of the dust out of the air along with leaves and debris from uh, the normal fall season that we have here. And when you go to put the glove box back in and close it, it's pretty simple. As you can see, they're already shaved down the little ends, the stops. And what happens is you just push it back in and it will not come back out unless you actually bend it back in. And we put the registration and the paperwork back in. Speaking of paperwork, I always like to be nosy to see if anybody's looked in and ever taken out the owner's manual. Nope, I don't know if this young lady would even know what the owner's manual looks like, but it is in a red case, and we're going to advise her to maybe take a couple minutes and look through it. All right, let's go grab, just go jump on our Subaru and see what it's all about. Remember, Subaru has one thing that only a couple of other car companies have, and that's all-wheel drive in all of their vehicles. For 2015, Subaru has done a heck of a job on this vehicle. One of the first guys uh, to get the car for road testing evaluations. And I've had the car about a week. Had it during the snow that they had uh, during Thanksgiving. Was up in New Hampshire with it, and wow. Unbelievable, just walk through the snow with the all-wheel drive. Big tires, alloy wheels, disc brakes all around, all-wheel drive, a large touchscreen audio and navigation system. Yeah, they did a great job on this car. Let's take a look inside, then we'll open up the hood, we'll open up the back and show you all the storage that this car actually can handle. Uh, buttons, I love buttons, and here you go, folks. Heated seats, low, high, medium, and low, yes, I love my heated seats. Electric parking brake now. If you take a close look at the steering wheel, all steering wheel hub controls. As you can see right here, for radio, audio, cruise control. If you look at the seating, it has nice contrast stitching, very form and supportive seating, which I think is a big plus. These floor mats are made to take abuse and made for the rugged outdoors. The seats fold down, it gives you a tremendous amount of cargo room. Hi Ma, I'm home! You want to shut the tailgate? Just push the button again and automatically, like magic, it'll shut. Rear view cameras are big today and stand on this vehicle and you'll see it's right here mounted on top of the license plate area and what that does gives you a real nice broad camera view. The engine compartment, I think you'll be very amazed what Subaru did. They still have the Boxster design motor, which is a flat engine, and the pistons go in and out like this. On conventional cars, they go straight up and down or a V. On the Subaru, they actually go side to side. They've had that design a long time, which allows them to keep the low, height, the low hood profile. Nice job on it. And this has 175 horsepower without any power adders like a turbocharger or a supercharger. You open up the hood, they have hood prop struts instead of having a hood prop rod. So guess what? The hood stays up by itself. A little bit of sound insulation here, sound insulation here, liquid filled engine mounts really quiet this engine down completely. The grill is what they call an active grill, which actually will open and close a little bit for added fuel economy in the highway. I mean, they kind of thought of everything when they put this thing together. And gas mileage, again, is way up over the predecessing years. What do you think? Wanna go for a ride? Okay, so we're in our 2015 Subaru Outback, and it certainly is an interesting car. And again, these guys were working on this car for quite a while. If you take a look around the dash layout, the illumination of the speedometer and tachometer, 
I mean, you have the map, you have audio, you push the map button and bingo. It's clear as a bell, you know? It's right there and it's large. And if you want to change it around, right now we're on West Grove Street. You can push the menu button and we can change it. You want to put a destination in, you want to change your route. You want the guidance volume up or down. I mean, there's just so much in this thing. And we go right back to the map. You want information, you push an information button all while you're driving. The weather today, well, we can do that pretty good too. And this is real time weather. It's right there. And today it's 33 degrees, have a low of 28. Sunday, 55, I hope that's right. You want to grab a forecast, you push a button there. And I mean, you have everything right in front of you. you have, that's real time. I think that this is a top rated vehicle. Even the insurance companies rate it very, very high. If you're looking for all wheel drive capability, no shift in a pull into four wheel drive, all wheel drive, it's all done automatically. Are you gonna pull a big boat with this? No. Are you gonna pull someone out of the snowbank that's you know in a gully with this car? Probably not, it's not made for that. This is not a truck. This is an all wheel drive, very personable and functional, utilitarian, I think, four wheel drive or all wheel drive vehicle that has the heated seats, it has everything one could want, all for under 30 bucks, 30,000 buckos with a good warranty. So if you're in the market for a car like this, you might want to check out your local Subaru dealer. And there is a big difference between the 2014 and the 2015 model. So it's going to be up to you in what you want to go with. Do you want to go with the one year old model, save a few bucks? Well, if you're going to keep the car for more than four or five years, I think I'd be real leery on that. I think I'd want to step up and get the best the first time around the rodeo and I think you'd be doing a great job. And if you've noticed, you can't even hear the engine and you can't feel the transmission shifting because it has a new variable, continuous variable, what they call automatic transmission that is six speeds. And yes, you can manually shift it. As I'm clicking the shifter up and down, you can see the RPMs from the engine and actually hear a little bit of it. And this is all without taking my eyes off the road or my hands off the wheels. On the full acceleration, going in and around corners, you can really treat this like a true sports car. You know, we talked about the gas mileage on this vehicle. It's much better than the predecessor. We're getting anywhere between 28 and 33 miles per gallon on this vehicle, depending on how you drive it. And this vehicle has a $300 optional, what they call P0 engine, which really refines the uh, emissions coming out the back end of the tailpipe. You can't breathe it, but it makes it a lot more healthier uh, compared to the cars gone by. And it really is a clean burning vehicle, which means that there's very little waste coming out the tailpipe and it has a really nice catalytic converter uh, system in the exhaust system. So it really burns off as much as the fuel as it can. We'll just take this right off the road like a lot of people do when they go up to a ski lodge. And I'm certainly not afraid of it. The height from the bottom of the uh, ground to the um, actual frame of the car is 8.7 inches. And you might say, wow, that's high. Yeah, it might be high, but you have to look at it this way. The way they designed the seats, we can get in and out of it without any problem. Well, that's it folks for 2015, for 30,000 and change, our loaded Subaru Outback gets the job really done well. And again, you wanna cut the price down a bit, go without the sunroof, go without the navigation, you save yourself probably about three grand. So you're down in the uh, $26,995 price range or so, which I think is a really respectable price for a car that can pretty much give you everything, including 30 plus miles per gallon with all wheel drive. For the Subaru, I'm Junior D'Amato.